the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. And direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations and carry them on by thy gracious assistance so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee be happy and through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so we're going to, the conference is going to be on prudence. So what we need to do is just a little bit of preliminary work is to talk first about habits. A habit is actually uh, a quality that resides in your faculty. And if it's a good habit, it makes your faculty good. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So a habit, then, in relationship to, is if it's good, then it's a virtue. And by habit, we mean that it, we have this inclination. The faculty has been uh, formed in such a way that it's inclined towards its object either strongly or less strongly, etc., but it's in a moderated way, so that it's inclined based upon reason. That is, reason has seen where the mean lies. So virtue is always, a mean. the moral virtues are means, that is, they lie between excess and defects, which we'll talk more about later. But this habit is a virtue, so it inclines me towards something. And Aristotle says virtue does two things. First is it makes the faculty good. Actually, it makes the person good, he says, but it makes the faculty good. And by that we mean because it's a quality, this quality, it's an operative, what we call an operative quality. So it's, it's a qualitative change of the individual, which, in, which then has the ability to incline them towards something. So if it inclines them towards something good, it actually makes the person good. People will say things like, I'm a good person. Meanwhile, they've had an abortion and they're sleeping with their boyfriend. Or, you know, he's, he's uh, smoking marijuana every weekend, etc. Well, I'm a good person. Yeah, no, you're not. So the fact, because you don't have these qualities in your various faculties that incline you towards the good. But usually they just mean I'm a good person. It just means I'm not ill-willed, which actually you are that too. Because if you're choosing things that are evil, even though you may not be hurting people directly or what have you, you still uh, doesn't make you good. The second thing is it inclines us to the good. So it makes us good and it inclines us to the good. And what that basically means is, is that when you have a virtue, reason is the thing. So there's this reason sees what the moderation is, inclines the faculty. The faculty then becomes formed to incline to that degree in that way. And then as a result of that, over the course of time, when it builds up, because a habit requires a series of actions, then once that happens, then the faculty becomes formed and it becomes good. That's how the person becomes good. So a good person is one who has a lot of virtue. The other per the person who's evil is the one who does not. The virtue then, so since it inclines to, uh, the action, it inclines us towards a specific kind of action, more or less. So inclines me to eat, but only in a moderated way. But it also, the action is specified, or the habit, even the virtue, is determined or specified by the object about which the action is concerned. What does that mean? It means that the virtue of temperance deals with, uh, St. Thomas says generically it deals with anything that has to do with bodily pleasure, but in one particular case it deals with food. Right, so the object is food. The action is eating, so how much, uh, what's the inclination of the action towards that? So it's not just that I eat, but it's how I eat. Do I eat excessively? Do I eat too quickly? Do I eat uh, uh, only dainty foods, which we'll see later? Okay, so um, this is the, it moderates, the virtue moderates the action of the faculty towards its specific object, okay? This becomes important because St. Thomas says, which we'll deal with now, St. Thomas says that prudence, the ends of prudence are predetermined. And what he means by that is, is that prudence is uh, something that, uh, that reason sees as this is the action, the best action to achieve this end. But the ends of human life are predetermined by the natural law. So things like marriage, food, living in common, uh, etc. These are all act, these are all ends to which 
I can either choose to pursue or not, but they're predetermined. I can't say, well, I, I don't want my human, my own personal participation in human nature to be inclined towards marriage. Sorry, that's not the way it works. We automatically have that. It's already built into our structure. What we have the choice, so we don't have a choice over the ends. God's predetermined those. What we have is a choice over whether I'm going to pursue an end or not. That's what I have. Okay. So I can choose to either become a priest or a nun or, a, um, or get married. Okay. Okay. So these virtually the objects, if it's a natural object, if the object is natural, then the virtue is acquired. And what we mean by that is when you're born, you have absolutely no virtue whatsoever. None. All you have is a disposition towards a particular series of actions, right? Okay, so you have no virtue whatsoever. So I have to acquire it. And the way I acquire it is by performing the actions repeatedly in order to develop the virtue, okay? Each time I make a choice, if I choose to not act virtuously, it detracts from my virtue or causes vice. Whereas if I act virtuously, then it increases it. So it can kind of be a tug of war where people kind of reach a mean where sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. Okay. So, but this acquired virtue is, uh, it's a natural thing, but it also has man as its cause. So both its object is some natural thing like food or conjugal relations or justice in relationship to each other, etc. Or, so it's a natural object, and then it has, the virtue has man as its cause. So if I relate to, the, to this, my very choice in, in, in executing the action itself, so my choice and the execution actually causes the virtue to begin to exist in me. Okay. If, the na if the object is supernatural, namely God, then it's infused. And what that means is, is that the object itself is above us, and therefore it's beyond our nature, and as a result, God is the cause of this virtue. And it means that you, you yourself cannot increase it or decrease it on your own. All you can do for infused virtue, St. Thomas says, is perform the action which would dispose you to the increase and then subsequent to that, God will infuse the virtue. This is why I tell people, for example, one of the big common ones I deal a lot with is I tell people, confidence in God. Most people don't have much confidence in God. But confidence in God, you have to perform the action. You just have to tell them, God, I have confidence in you. Even if you don't feel it, right? And even if you realize I don't have it. We see this even in the act of contrition. I, I, but most of all, because they offend thee, my God. Well, that's not true. I mean, in most people's case, now some people it's true, but most people that's not it. But why do you say it? Are you saying something false? No, what you're doing is you're performing the action to dispose yourself so that it will become true. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with confidence, okay, and trust in God and hope in God. I just perform the action and then he'll infuse more of it in, and then as a result of that, it's the same thing with charity. So the more I perform, the more I tell God I love you, I love you, I love you, right? Uh, obviously in a right New York way. Uh, then what happens is over the course of time, it disposes me towards an increase and then I will start to love him more. Okay. And so God is the cause of it. And the object is supernatural. All uh, infused virtues, there are two kinds. There's the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Theological. And then there are the moral virtues infused moral virtues. So we'll talk about this, but there is an acquired virtue of prudence and there's an infused virtue in prudence. There's acquired virtue of justice and an infused virtue of justice. So an example that is very important is even though we have a natural inclination to justice to its sub-virtue of religion, that virtue can the natural virtue of religion cannot be fulfilled without the infused virtue of religion. It's impossible. Okay. That being said, uh, that's not true of all of the infused virtues. So then the question becomes, well, wait a minute. So if, uh, and the infused virtues, by the way, occur when, as soon as you're in the state of grace. 
So once you're baptized, God infuses all of the supernatural moral virtues. So you have infused prudence. So then people ask, well, wait a minute. Why, does it, why don't kids act prudently? Very simple. St. Thomas says that if there's a defect or a blockage or an obstacle in, the, in that faculty in relationship to the operation of the virtue, you can't perform the, that virtue, or that virtue is not operative. What does that mean concretely? It means that if I have a natural vice of carnal prudent, imprudence, right? So I've got this vice of imprudence, it's carnal prudence, where I'm really only looking at everything from the point of view of how much money can I make off this thing, right? If that's the only way I'm looking at it, then what happens is, is that the, the, the supernatural virtue of prudence is blocked in its ability to function. So the way you get the infused virtues to function well is to remove the, def the natural vices or defects that block its activity. So what does this mean? It means this is why there's three stages of the interior life, by the way. The first, the act of purgation, is to uh, obtain acquired virtues in all of the areas and remove all the vices that you can of the acquired virtues. Then you enter into luminative way where the infused virtues become more operative. So this is a process. Everybody has to go through it. Okay. All right. So uh, anytime you're in the state of grace, you have the infused virtues, but they may or may not, the degree in which they become active is directly proportionate to how much virtue or vice I have in the, on an acquired level. So if I have a lot of acquired virtue, then the, I start to transition where my, my object, why am I doing it? So once I've attained the, the natural virtue of temperance, then my, I'll start doing temperance for God's sake. You know, I'm going to forego this food. Some, so people will forego the food because they want to lose weight or they want to be healthy, right? Which is a good thing. It's not bad. But then over the course of time, as they grow in virtue uh, and they remove it, and if they're trying to seek holiness, then what will happen is it'll slowly transition to, well, I'm going to give this up for him, right? Mm -hmm. Not for me, not for anything. I'm going to get out of it. Okay. But anytime I'm in the state of grace, I have these virtues. How much they're, how much they work is, is proportionate to, I've kind of removed these defects, but then I've also started to develop those virtues as well. So, uh, for example, um, at first, I might just develop the virtue of benignity or, uh, or benevolence, where I have goodwill towards people, right? But eventually, after a certain point, then I'm going to start developing charity, where I actually do, I do good things for God, that, that I love them for God's sake. And then I can keep developing that to where the, the virtue becomes very, the virtue of charity becomes very strong and very operative in relationship to that. Okay, so it's a, it's a building process. So... What we want to do then is take a look at the moral virtues. And so the first one is going to be prudence. Okay. Prudence, St. Thomas defines as the application of right reason to action. Okay, that's the short definition. Application of right reason to action. What's right reason? It's reason that's in congruity with the truth. In other words, in conformity with the truth. So it's the one in which what I actually understand in my mind is in conformity with reality. But prudence involves several things that we have to take a look at. So prudence is the application of right reason. And this right reason, St. Thomas says, is the reason that is informed or knowledgeable about the principles of the moral life and the precepts which flow from those principles. What does that mean? Well, an example of a principle of right reason is do good and avoid evil, or God is to be obeyed, or things of this sort, right? So these are principles. Concretely, they're going to find themselves in precepts. So do good and avoid evil means I don't steal other people's property, you know, or I don't lie to people, or I don't eat other people's food, necessarily. Okay, so the point being is, is that the precepts, the, the principles are just a general knowledge, there's a general statement. The precepts actually tell me, avoid this or do this kind of activity, because there can be positive precepts and negative precepts. 
And so one of the things I'm going to deal with right now, just so we have it out of the way, is in the document Amoris Laetitia, it says that St. Thomas says there's these general principles, but that when you come down to the concrete, there's, the principles don't apply. And that is not at all what St. Thomas says. What St. Thomas says is that there are certain general precepts that apply everywhere in all cases, like do good and avoid evil, applies everywhere and in all cases. But then he says, when it comes to certain kinds of actions, he said, which principles apply is based upon the circumstances. So, for example, one of the precepts that we have is we have an obligation to correct our neighbor if he's doing something wrong. However, when that precept is enacted, is based upon the principle of my obligation to not do harm to the person that... I would be correcting. So if I'm going to say something and it's going to make it worse, then I wait. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that principle moderates when I'm going to say something when it's not. So that in every single moral action, every single thing we do, there is always some moral principle that applies. Which so, so there's some that apply everywhere in all cases. There's some precepts that apply everywhere in all cases. Thou shalt not commit adultery applies everywhere and in all cases. There is no circumstance under which that does not apply, right? Whereas other things, like the positive precepts, like uh, thou, you know, you have an obligation to fraternally correct your brother, is going to uh, apply. The precept will be applied mediating the circumstances that are there, okay? And that's going to bring in a variety of different principles in order to judge that, okay? So, okay, so it's the application of right reason. So right reason, then, you have to have knowledge of the principles and the precepts. You actually have to have a formed conscience. You have to know this is good and this is bad. And this is good to this degree and this is bad to that degree, etc. You also need to know the principles. And these can be by degrees. So the more you know these on the level of knowledge, so the more I have knowledge of the principles like the natural law, the... Um, the precepts, you know, like the Ten Commandments, the various aspects of the Ten Commandments, then the more I'm going to be able to take that knowledge and be able to apply it in the concrete. Because that's really what prudence does. It helps me go from understanding something to knowing what to do in a particular case. So, that's right, please, and apply to action. And so we're trying to figure out what's the right thing to do. So sometimes prudence will be defined as the virtue by which I know the right thing to do under the right circumstances. And so to apply it in the concrete, concrete, another word for concrete is the circumstances under which the action would occur. All right, so this is the structure of it. I have to have right reason, I have to know it. I have to know then the various kinds of actions that are going to lead to, those, to, to the implication, Im, implementation of do, or achieving the end. In relationship to the circumstances. Okay, so when you parse this out, then you have the end which you're trying to achieve, you have the action that gets there, and you have the circumstances, you have the circumstances that are surrounding the action which will affect how the action actually achieves the end or not. For example, so I decide that. Uh, I want to be kind to midgets. And I know there's certain there's little people today, but I think that political correctness is absurd. Okay. So, I want to be kind to midgets. Right. Now, the circumstances, you know, standing on top of a building and throwing them off the building isn't being kind to them. Right. Or putting them in boiling water isn't kind to midgets. Okay. So, what I have to do is that, or... If I'm going to do something at a particular time, so for example, if, if um, uh, a, a common example that's given in moral theology is, if my desire is to comply with the obligations that my parents or the precepts that my parents have told me, like you can't be out past 10 o'clock, then, then the time in which I am out roaming around is past 10 o'clock then the circumstance makes this action not achieve the end of trying to fulfill my obligations to my parents. 
So the, the circumstances can actually be a means in a certain way towards achieving the end, but they moderate how well the action is going to achieve that. So let's go back to the fraternal correction. My de desire is to the, the desire is that my neighbor not be in error about or, and not and stop objectively sinning at least. The action is I have to sit him down and tell him, hey, look, what you're doing is wrong. But the circumstance takes into consideration his state. So if he is just unwilling to listen to anything that I have, then the action is actually not going to achieve its end because of the circumstance. So prudence has to then judge. It has to have knowledge of the end, which is somewhat connected to the principles and precepts. But you have to have knowledge of the end. The action, so the precepts tell me which actions are uh, acceptable or not. And then you have to have knowledge of the circumstances. Those are the three things. You have to have, know what the end is. You have to know what kinds of actions achieve that end. And then you have to have a knowledge of the circumstances. Normally speaking, the place where people's prudence goes out the window or things start to get fuzzy is in judging the circumstances. And the reason being is, is because the circumstances are actually known in the image, in the imagination. And that image in the imagination is affected by our emotions. And so once you attain greater virtue, your emotions start to become subordinated to reason. Your images will begin to clear up. And as a result, you'll be able to judge things more prudently. Mm -hmm. But if you're constantly acting based on your emotions, it literally destroys your ability to know what is prudent because you're never going to have sufficiently clear images to know what to do in the concrete. This is why the training that we're giving in our culture where everybody's following their emotions is extraordinarily dangerous. We're setting ourselves up for uh, a lot of trouble. Okay. So, uh, prudence applies, again, the universal principles or knowledge uh, known in the concrete. One also, however, in order to have prudence, even though prudence resides, because every virtue resides in a faculty, because it's a habit in a faculty, and a faculty is just the ability of the soul to perform some kind of action. So, and in the case of prudence, it's in the intellect and its object. So, St. Thomas says that in relationship to, there's a difference between practical knowledge and what we call speculative knowledge which is just another way of saying theoretical knowledge. So theoretic knowledge not, uh, pertains to the virtue of science. The practical knowledge pertains to the virtue of prudence because you're actually dealing with, practical knowledge deals with action. Speculative knowledge just deals with knowledge of things. Okay, so in relationship to prudence, you, need, you do need a certain amount of scientific knowledge in order to be really prudent, but the practical knowledge is something that has to be developed as well. So, this means that it's in the intellect, so this knowledge of practically what am I going to do is something that's known in the intellect. So it's a virtue that resides in the intellect. However, St. Thomas says, that's not enough to have prudence. I have to have rectitude of will. I can know the prudent, prudent thing to do, almost repeatedly. But if I don't choose to do it or follow it, I'm not prudent. So, and over the course of time, that's going to end up eroding even my judgment. But the fact is, is that you have to have rectitude of the will. Otherwise, you're not going to, you're not going to choose to apply things properly in the concrete. Two essential criteria for the virtue of prudence. One... Prudence requires experience. We're going to see this when we get to the sub-virtue of memory. Okay. In other words, I have to have the right kinds of experience. This is why, you know, I am somewhat critical of the millennials, but I kind of cut them some slack because the reason they're this way is because their experience is such that their intellectual and appetitive formation was completely derailed in the public school system, etc., and so as a result of that, 
you can't expect them to act prudently because of the fact that they don't have the intellectual formation, they don't have their appetites in order, and as a result of that, they're not going to be doing it. And they don't, in other words, they don't have the right kinds of experiences when they're younger to know what the right thing to do is. So it's the right kind of experience. So people will sit there and say, well, how can you tell me what's right and wrong in relationship to the stuff about, that pertains to the Sixth Commandment if you've never done it? <laughs> I don't have to have the wrong kind of experience to know what's right. The wrong kind of experience just tells me what's wrong. It doesn't tell me what's right. Yeah, that's right. And in moral matters, it's not just a matter of negating it, right? Mm -hmm. You actually have to have the right experience. Second... In order to be prudent, the image has to be properly prepared. In other words, my experience is from the past. It's not just that I have the right experiences. I have to have a kind of set of habits that helps me to remember or to associate the right things at the right time. Because if I don't, I'm still not going to be prudent. Okay. St. Thomas says that prudence actually requires the other moral virtues as well. In other words, you can't be prudent if every time you're around food, you're eating to the point where your stomach is about to burst. Okay. So, prudence and the other virtues kind of go hand in hand. Okay. But if I don't have prudence, how can I learn prudence? And Aristotle says... Because, it, 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 you know, with the other virtues, I can kind of know, okay, this is what I need to do, and I can do it, but this is a case of knowledge. So if I don't even know, if I don't have the right experiences, how am I going to know? He says, you have to ask the prudent man, which we'll see in a minute. There are three kinds of virtues. We want to make a distinction because now we're going to talk about the sub-virtues to prudence. So prudence is the virtue in the intellect by which I know the right thing to do in the right way under the right circumstances, etc. Okay. There are three kinds of virtues. The first is called... Um, integral virtues. Now, integral virtues are the kinds that it, they're sub virtues to other the cardinal virtues. So, the next eight virtues we're going to talk about in relationship to prudence are all integral virtues, which means if you lack just one of these virtues, just one, you're not prudent. Hmm. That's basically it. You have to have all of the integral prudent in, integral parts of a virtue in order to have that virtue. So, uh, and this is, becomes kind of a key thing. Okay, you'll see this as we go through when you start looking at, yeah, if a person doesn't have that, they're not prudent. Okay. The next is what we call the subjective parts. Okay. The subjective virtues are subjective, uh, by the way, this is not, we're not talking about here we're relativistic or something of that sort or pertaining to the individual. What we're talking about is, is that the subjective virtues are those that fall under another virtue, and so you can have the other virtues in that area without having that particular virtue. So, for example, a person can have temperance in relationship to food, but not in relationship to the matters of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments, or vice versa. So you can find a guy who's very chaste, but he's, you know, 500 pounds. Okay. So the subjective virtues, we'll see that when we get to temperance. Also when we get to um, justice uh, and uh, not so much fortitude. Okay. The next one is what we call potential virtues. These are ones which, they're like the subjective virtues. You can have the other virtues, so you can have the virtue of temperance without having the, uh, the potential virtue of modesty. So I can have control in relationship to food while lacking modesty in relationship to how I dress or how I talk to people or what have you. So, but the poten they're called potential virtues because their matter doesn't fall directly under temperance. So the, in relationship to modesty, the things that pertain to modesty don't actually deal with bodily pleasures. They actually deal with things that can lead to those, mm -hmm. okay, or affect those, okay. So what we want to do is talk about the eight integral parts of prudence. I know this is a lot of information in a short period of time, but the good news is there's no exam.
Uh, well, actually, there is. It's called your final judgment, but don't worry about that. Okay. All right. The integral part of prudence, the first one, is the virtue of memory. Now, here we're not talking about the faculty of memory. We're talking about the actual virtue of memory. The virtue of memory is the habit or the virtue in which, I, in other words, I'm in the habit of remembering the right thing at the right time. So, uh, you might have heard me talk about this, I can't remember. But when it comes to, uh, a perfect example of this was, I think it was Bart, but it could have been Homer. Lisa in The Simpsons, not that I'd recommend you watch it, but was uh, trying an experiment with his rat, <laughs> right? And, so, and he was trying to compare, how, who's smarter, the rat or Bart? <laughs> and so he, she sets up this little thing where when you press this bar, you get a shock, right? And so the rat goes out, presses it once, gets a shock and runs away and never presses it again, right? Whereas Bart is sitting there, ow, 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 <laughs> ow, ow. We laugh at this, but this is the problem with drunkards, right? They don't remember the fallout. They don't remember the hangover when they see the booze. That just goes out the window. All they're thinking is... All they can really remember is, hey, this, I'm going to really enjoy this because I remember this last time we got drunk. We had such a great time. Right? But they're not thinking the next three days it was like wrung out. Mm -hmm. So they don't remember the right thing at the right time. Okay. So obviously without the virtue of memory, you're not going to have it. Now, the memory is where all these experiences are contained. So we actually, there's in the virtue of memory then, we have to be in the habit of remembering the right things at the right time. And that means when the wrong things come up, we have to say, no, I'm not going to pay attention to that. This is the right thing. And so we actually train the memory. We train the intellect to remember the right things at the right time. This is why in the medieval period, they considered people who did not do sufficient development of their faculty of memory to be violating the virtue of prudence. This is one of the reasons why you can have people like St. Thomas who could sit down and read an 80-page book and basically be able to give somewhere between 95 and 99% of the book back to you after a single reading. Wow. And it's not just because the guy was a genius, which is true. They had techniques in which they actually developed the memory. This is one of the reasons why the church used to have people memorize the Baltimore Catechism. Because then you had that information there that you could call upon and it developed the virtue of memory. Today, of course, we have the opposite problem. Uh, I think it was about 10 years ago when they first started studying this, they, they, started, they said, okay, how long is it? take from the time somebody looks something up on their phone to the time in which they forget it, and it was 22 seconds. Four years ago or three years ago, it was down to 11 seconds. At the last count, it's down to seven seconds. Wow. That is a sign. And so in other words, it's really our memories are atrophying. All this quick, ready a access, which by the way is nice, but you still have to commit this stuff to memory. Right? You have to memorize this. You, have to, you need to memorize certain formulations in order so that you have these things or and to develop the memory well so that you'll remember the right things at the right time. Okay. The next is the virtue, not the act of the intellect, but the virtue of understanding. Now, the virtue of understanding is the ability to grasp practical principles and the nature of the various situations. So there's two things that it helps me to grasp. The first, so it helps me to grasp the first principles, or the, the principles that govern what is right and what is wrong. So let me give you an example where people don't have the virtue of understanding. One of the principles is when you look at the natural law, the second category of the natural law, you know that the conjugal act is fundamentally ordered towards having children. That's its structure, that's its nature. The pleasure is purely an accidental thing that's added on, layered on top of it. St. Thomas calls and Aristotle called it the supervening good, okay? The first principle though is, is this is the structure of human beings and this is what we're inclined towards. Most people don't have a grasp of that at all today in our culture. They don't understand 
basic principles in relationship to the morally right and wrong. Or another one is the principle of the integral good, that the end, the circumstances, and your action, what's sometimes called the object, all have to be good. All of them have to be good. If there's a defect in any one of those, the whole action is rendered morally bad. Not, and that's the principle of the integral good. Most people can't grasp that today. So they'll, you know, they'll do something that ends up badly, and they'll say, well, it's okay because my intention was X. That's not good enough, right? It still doesn't mean what you did was good. Or, you know, they'll, or they think the ends justify the means. You know, it's okay to drop bomb on civilians and kill a bunch of innocent people in order to end a war, right? So they'll say that kind of thing. And so this is, the, uh, this is the problem where people don't even grasp, they don't understand the first principles that even govern the moral life. The second thing is, is they have to have understanding of the circumstances. Now, in modern parlance, we sometimes call this, although it's a kind of a broader category, we call it common sense. Right? Some people just don't have any common sense. They just don't get it. So, for example... Uh, I think you might, you might have heard me say this. One time I was with my brother-in-law. He has his SUV and we pull up to a gas station. He gets out and I look over and the woman is holding a cigarette in between his, her fingers on the pump handle pumping her gas. Wow. <laughs> and this is clearly a case of a lack of understanding. And I'm saying to my brother, let's get out of here, let's get out of here. <laughs> so, by the grace of God, she was protected by her guardian angel or something. It didn't blow up, right? Okay. So this is an ability to grasp the circumstances. This understanding, the grasping of the, uh, the, of the um, this understanding of the circumstances is a habit that has to be developed in the sense that you have, it's, especially when you're younger, you, you really have to depend on people who are experienced who can tell you, look, you don't want to do these particular things because it's going to lead to this. These circumstances can cause these problems, etc. Right? Then as you become very proficient at it and you've developed it, you've been docile to that process, and then you can start understanding and analyzing circumstances really well. So in, uh, when I was in the last society that I was in, one of my nicknames was the prophet. I'm like, I'm not the prophet. And they're like, because, because, and the reason being is, is because I could look at circumstances and say, this kind of set of circumstances most likely is going to lead to this, which is also part of the virtue of foresight, which we'll see in a minute. But I said, these circumstances aren't good. This is what you're going to get out of this, right? And then they would do it, and then it would go bad. And then they would come back at me and blame me. I'm like, I wasn't the one who did this. I just pointed out, you know, you throw, ga you throw a match on gasoline, that's what happens, right? Okay, so the point is, is that you have to be able to understand the circumstances really well. And this also comes through clear images. And that means that the less vices, the less you follow your emotions when you're younger and the less you follow them as you get older, and the more you're trying to follow it, the less it's going to affect your images. And as a result of that, the more you're going to understand circumstances. We know this to be the case, right? Because I can't tell you how many times people will come to me and say, Father, I need to correct my, my sister because she's doing X, right? I'll, I'll, so I'll ask them, well, is she going to be, I, I don't know what the circumstances, so I have to ask them, do you think she'll be open to it? I'm like, well, I, I don't know. You know. In other words, they can't read people well because of the fact that they have this emotional relationship with them. Okay, and so the emotions can affect their judgment of the circumstances. So you need to have understanding. The next is the virtue of docility. Docility is the virtue in which one has the ability to be led and to take counsel from others. Docility applies in two ways. One, in the sense of generally in your moral life, there's going to be times you're going to have to just go to somebody and say, what do we do? You know, somebody who's dealt with that same thing over and over and over again. That's the person you actually want to go talk to. Uh, especially, you know, as again, because dos, when, if I don't have a lot of experiences, I don't have a lot of stuff in order to draw upon in order the right to do the right thing to do. And as a result of that, I tend to, well, I'll, I'll do things that are imprudent 
Whereas if I rely on someone else, you know, like, what do you think, then he'll tell you. The other thing is docility is a very quick way to learn a lot of things about how circumstances or principles pry in the circumstance. What the first pastor I was under was an older guy. He was in his mid to late 60s, late 60s, I think, when I was placed under him. And uh, I was a newly ordained priest. And he one time gave me a phenomenal piece of advice. He said, if people come to you and they want to get married and you look at them and you realize these people have no business getting married, then that's the circumstance. He said, then what do you do? He said, what you do is you drag your feet. You slow the marriage prep down. And he says, inevitably they'll break up. It worked every single time I tried it. I never would have figured that out on my own. Hmm. And so having that docility of listening to him, hey, you know, that sounds pretty good, right? And just doing it. And sometimes when you don't even know, you just have to do it and hope that, and then when the, as the outcome starts to occur, then you realize, okay, this guy actually knew what he was talking about. But this means that you also have to have decent judgment. You have to look at the prudent man. Who's the guy who's actually leading a prudent not life? Not just somebody who you like who's going to tell you what you want to hear, which is what people are doing. People don't have real docility, you know. They'll, they'll, they want to contracept, and so they'll shop around until they find a priest who says they can contracept. That's not true docility, right? Okay. It's also lack of goodwill. So you have to be willing to be led, and that means you have to be willing to take counsel from other people. Now, this is a mean, because sometimes you can get people who they're so afraid of doing something wrong that they'll just come to you with every little thing, and you just have to say, look, you've got to stand on your own feet here. You know, so I'll ask them, what do you think? Well, I think it's this. Well, then do it, right? Because they, obviously they were right. If they weren't, I'd say, well, wait a minute. Okay. Uh, the next one is um, shrewdness. Okay. Shrewdness <laughs> is the ability to quickly arrive at the means to the end. It's the virtue in which you can immediately say, this is the best thing to do. Right? Or this is likely to give it us the best. You can get people who aren't very shrewd. So something will come up and they're sitting there thinking for days on days when they should have just turned the, the, the faucet off when it was flooding in the house. Should I turn this on? Or should I turn this on? You know, what will John say if I don't turn this on? What am I, you know, and you're just like, turn the thing off. Right? Okay. So shrewdness is that ability to quickly arrive at the means. Now, that comes, again, that, that shrewdness, the different kinds of actions are going to come from having the right experiences and remembering the right things. So shrewdness depends on memory. But there, ha there has to be that ability to quickly arrive at it. And you see some people, they're just not very shrewd. I mean, they just can't seem to kind of grasp it. And shrewdness is, there's a certain innate disposition to be shrewd, but it's something that to develop. And the way, how do you develop it? It's when you see someone else doing something well and it happens, you remember that. Okay, this leads to that. So that's what I used to tell people. They said, were you the, because I'm the youngest in the family. Oh, you're the one who got away with everything. I said, yeah, but I was also the guy who would watch what happened to my brothers and sisters and say, okay, note to self, don't do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you didn't get in trouble much. Well, no, not really. Because of the fact that I would like, okay, don't do that. Okay, and so when these things would come up, you try and remember immediately, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, in other words, and also when you do things yourself, then you learn that, you know, which things will quickly lead to other things. That also means that there's going to be some people that are just never going to be that prudent because they just may not be bright enough to be able to develop that shrewdness. Okay. The next one is reason. And here we're not talking about the faculty of reason. We're talking about the virtue of reason. <clears throat> this is the virtue in which one has the ability to reason well regarding practical matters. I had a relative whose IQ was about 20 to 30 points higher than mine. This guy was a walking genius. But he couldn't find his way out of a practical paper bag. His entire life was an example of what happens when a guy is disconnected from reality because he's just so up in his head, right? He literally did not have the ability to reason on practical matters. Okay. 
This is the ability to apply universal principles in the concrete. So the person who has the virtue of reason is the one who can say, you, you, you can start out that says, uh, all forms of theft are immoral. Or, or, or all forms of theft are not to be done. That's the general principle, right? The next premise is this. This is called the practical syllogism, by the way. This is a case of theft. So what's the practical application of it? Do not steal. Or do not commit theft at this time. Or not, in other words, do not take this. Okay, would be the conclusion. I mean, there's a more formal way this is done. You can read my dissertation if you want to find that. But the point being is, is that this is the ability to reason, to see how things fit together on a practical level. And so a lot of times people, they might know the general principles. I find that a lot. You'll find people who really know the general principles but this, the, the, the minor premise, is what's known through the circumstances. <clears throat> and if they don't have good, clear images or good, clear uh, understanding of the circumstances, a lot of times they misapply it. So, for example, I know that all forms of theft are immoral, right? But let's just say for the sake of argument, I'm standing next to somebody, some woman, and I see her purse and I think it's my purse. Which it's not, by the way. <laughs> Then, because I don't know this, I'm not going to realize I shouldn't take it, right? Now, these can find things that are really subtle. So, for example, you ask the average person on the street, do you think murder is immoral? Yes. So then, abortion is murder, and you shouldn't have an abortion. No, I don't believe that. <laughs> and the reason being is, is because they don't see that in this particular case, the print, that they're actually taking a human life. See, they don't understand the concrete well, and they, so as a result, they don't reason well. The other thing is, too, is, is one of the way, this also means that in order to do this, you have to be as objective as possible. This is why I tell people, look, if you have an emotion, you gotta get, the, you gotta get away from the whole discussion of what you gotta do, unless it's absolutely necessary at the moment. You gotta get away from it to get your mind to clear so that you know the concrete right thing to do. And a lot of people don't have that. This is one of the problems with the millennials. And again, I'm not picking on them, I'm just pointing this out because they're easy to, they're trying to say, look at the man, no. Okay. <laughs> but it's, it's basically like this. They went through their whole public school educational system, which told them, Johnny, two plus two equals four. How do you feel about that, Johnny? So that what was true and what wasn't true is based upon their emotional response to the thing. Then we wonder why, when they get out, if they, f they have an emotional response to something, like to politics or what have, or have you, why we see that they can't even reason. Literally, I've seen this. I I've seen this. I've actually done this with them, with a few of them. So all A is B, yeah. And all B is C, yeah. So then that means all A is B, all A is C. How, how do you get that? Why do they not, they don't see the connection of A to C because they haven't had an emotional response to tell them whether it's true or not. Oh. And they literally cannot reason because they've literally been deformed intellectually. Not all of them, of course. Some of them are actually very rational. In fact, sometimes they're kind of surprisingly so. But the, the, uh, the, the point being is, is that that process, this is something which uh, it's, uh, this is something, this reasoning process means you've really got to get the emotions out of it. Again, it goes back to docility. So let me give you an example. One time, and this is something that I learned, uh, a, couple of I, a couple of things. You might have heard me say this, but one time uh, I was a mechanic working for my father, and I had fixed this piece of machinery, and it didn't run. I couldn't get it started. I got really mad at it, right? And my dad just walks out and says, knock it off and fix it. Now there's two things I learned in that. One is your emotions just get in the way when it comes to doing the right thing, as a general rule. The second thing is, is that uh, it doesn't matter how you feel about something, if the thing isn't fixed, it ain't fixed. 
I might want the thing. I might feel that it's fixed. It's irrelevant to the reality of whether that thing is fixed or not. And this is something that, that people in our culture have been trained to the opposite of. Mm. It's only true if you have a positive emotional response in relationship to it. Okay. The next is foresight. Now, foresight is the ability to look at a series of circumstances and a, a, seri uh, and a, and a variety of different proposed actions to get there. And so foresight is the one that's going to show, show you based on past experience. So it's rooted in memory. You have to have that. So you're going to look and you're going to say, based on my past experience, when you do X, Y occurs. Okay. So foresight, sometimes called provident, uh, providence, is ability to see future outcomes of actions based on past experience. Okay, so what does this mean? It means people who don't have a lot of experience don't have a lot of foresight. If I have the wrong kinds of experience, I'm going to have the wrong foresight. I have to have the right kinds of experiences in order to see the con and I have to actually see the connection. It's not just I have a bunch of right experiences. I actually have to see the connection between these things and that thing. You know, when you do this, you don't do that, right? Or when this happens, make sure you do this. Right? So, and this is something that. Um, Again, you know, they used to call me the prophet. No, I'm just really good at looking to see how things are going to, what the outcome is going to be when you do these things, right? And part of that is, you know, <laughs> is part of it is just being a mechanic. You don't put oil in the thing and you try and start it and it runs. You're not, it, the, the, the foresight says it's going to go badly, right? It's the same thing and you can apply that same thing in relationship to human action. Okay. The next is circumspection. <clears throat> Circumspection is one of those virtues that is the last perfected and the first corrupted. Circumspection is the virtue by which one keeps track of one's circumstances. In other words, it's the, it's the virtue which helps me to, understanding helps me to understand different kinds of circumstances where circumspection helps me to pay attention to the circumstances so that I can understand what's going on. Uh, so I was giving an example of this earlier, but some, you know, one of the things, again, millennials, I don't want to pick on them, but they're just easy targets. <laughs> and a lot of them are really good, decent people, but... Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> when I'm sitting on an airplane, if I see a millennial coming down the aisle with a backpack... I will instinctively move into the corner. And a part of this is foresight. Why? Because over and over again, they walk through and they're doing this. As they're turning, and they're literally whacking practically every person going down the aisle. And they are absolutely oblivious to the fact that they're doing it. They have no circumspection. Why? Emotion causes contraction. When you get emotional, your focus turns inward to the emotion. And when your whole life you've been trained to determine in relationship to things, the reality is your emotional response. Your focus isn't on reality, it's on your emotions. And so when you're not having an emotion, then nothing's happening. So they're literally whacking you right and left, and they don't even know it. And this is a huge problem. Okay. So circumspection, why is it one of the first, uh, first corrupted and the last perfected? Every single external action that you perform, every single one of them, if it's not virtuous, is contrary to circumspection. So any time you perform an action that isn't rightly ordered, you're not keeping track of your circumstances. Perfect example, a couple goes into a grocery store. One of them gets angry with the other one and starts chewing the other spouse out right in public, right? I'm sure you've all seen this. You're like, ooh, that's ugly, right? Foresight tells me, get away, okay. So, and why did, the circumspe why did they lose circumspection? Well, obviously, arguing in, in is not that you don't do that in public. I'll tell you another example of this. It's very common, okay? You don't do it in public. 
But what happens is, is when you get angry, what does the anger do? The anger focuses on meeting out the vindication. So you lose all, anything that is not conducive to meeting out the vindication gets pushed aside. And as a result of that, you lose circumspection. Because what do you want to do? I just want to beat this person over the head. I don't care where it is. I just want to beat the person over the head. Okay. A perfect example of a lack of circumspection, which you see almost across the board, is something I always tell people never, ever, under any circumstance, unless there's something grave happening, like one of the children are drowning, you, the parents should never argue in front of the children, ever. And the reason being is because it's a lack of circumspection if you do, and the reason being is why. Because when the children see the arguing, first of all, it's, 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 uh, it can be traumatizing, but it also be wounding the child, even in minor ways, because they love both of the parents, they don't want to see that happening. But the other side of it is, is that the child implicitly learns that it's okay to contradict an authority in public. Oh, no. that's, what's, that's what's happening. That's the association they're going to make in relationship to the shrewdness later. So that's why you just don't do it. The point is, so, but circumspection, like all the time, people, I, I'm finding that circumspection is a gargantuan problem in relationship to modesty. People will, people who are generally speaking virtuous will start talking about matters that pertain to the sixth and ninth commandments in, in, in mixed company. And I'm like, that is not the place to be doing this. And they think, well, I'm familiar with this person or this person. I, we can talk about this. No, this is, you, you know, this, this woman ain't your wife. You don't go talking about these things with her. Okay. And even if they're not intending anything bad, you're just like, this is just not material to discuss. This is why St. Paul refers to sodomy as the sin that should never be mentioned. Now, there's time you obviously have to mention it. You have to be able to discuss it uh, when it comes to moral principles, etc. Or if it's become a problem in society, how you're going to deal with it. But, is, but in a virtuous society, that word should practically never be heard. Because it's something that's that disordered that you really shouldn't even mention it. You should never mention it in mixed company as a general rule in a virtuous, in a virtuous society. And in a non-virtuous society, you may have to discuss it from time to time. But generally, it should be discussed rarely. Okay. Caution. Oh, by the way, so this with circumspection, you got to, again, focus on the circumstances, what's going on here. Right? And so a lot of time, another way that area that, that people don't, that people lose circumspection is in relationship to God. Part of the reason you develop the virtue of recollection that is always keeping track of the fact that God's present is so that when you're acting in relationship to other people, you'll always be keeping track of God's here, so don't do anything stupid. But part of it is also, you know, when people get into fights, the first thing that goes out the door is objectivity. And circumspection is the thing that keeps you objective. Okay. Eight. So if you find yourself getting emotional, you've got to at least intellectually back away from the situation, get some distance. And that this is also important because you have to remember like, like circumspection, a lot of times people are just wounded and they're just taking it out on you. So instead of just hashing them back, look, just stand back and say, what does this person need? In other words, that means you have to put aside my own feelings. What does this person need to help them and to get this situation the best on the order of charity? The last one is caution. Caution is the application of knowledge of the past to the current action in order to avoid impediments and evil. It's the virtue that tells me, look, this thing could go bad, or this is possible difficulties that could arise in this. Okay. So an example of caution coupled with a lack of docility. A teenager decides that, who's never drank, someone hands them a beer. They drink the beer. They haven't felt the effects yet. Oh, I'm good. So instead of practicing caution, like, you know, I'm going to wait a little bit, see how this affects me. Then maybe I'll have another one. Instead, they drown like three or four beers, and then they can hardly, about, you know, 30 minutes later, they're staggering around. A, it's a lack of docility, because the parents say, look, don't drink excessively, or just have one drink, if they've even been told that. But there's just a general lack of caution. Like, this is stuff that can blow up, right? Uh, from time to time, you'll, so this is an example of the relationship to caution that's pretty common. Okay. This is why I tell exorcists, don't be afraid of the devil. Don't have fear, but you have to be cautious. Like, be careful with this guy. And one of the exorcists almost always fall into trouble 
when they start fudging on the caution factor. Like they become comfortable or familiar with the person who's possessed, the demoniac. And so as a result of that, over the course of time, they'll start engaging in, you know, just sitting and talking to them about other things. And then in the end, the next thing you know, there's a romantic feelings between each other, etc. That has, the caution has to be maintained in relationship to that. Okay. So those are the integral parts. We're getting close to being done, and then you can ask questions. Sorry, this is going on for a while. Prudence is one of those bloated virtues. Not quite as bad as justice, but it's uh, pretty loaded. Okay. There are, pot there are potential parts of prudence. These are the things that potentially they're connected to the matter of prudence, and so they can help you. The first is counsel. I think Thomas calls it eubulia, which literally means good counsel. This is the virtue in which one takes good counsel. You back up. You start sorting the things through. You clear your head. You start going through the various processes that could lead to it, etc. People tend to uh, suffer from precipitation, which is the vice where they don't take counsel. So in other words, their emotions rise up and they just immediately headlong choose a particular thing, which is bad news. Right? So you see the whole plate full of chocolate. Good counsel is, you know, the last time you ate that whole bowl of chocolate, things went bad. Maybe you should maybe just have one piece, or maybe you should ask so-and-so to take the chocolate away, or what have you. But instead, what does a person do? Their emotions like, chocolate, good. Oh. Then they eat the whole thing again, and they wonder, oh, I feel terrible. Okay, they're not taking good counsel. Part of it is also, too, is some things are complicated. It takes a while to sort certain things out. People who, as they get older and their emotions begin to calm down, they tend to be a little less precipitous because they take more time. Now, they, that can go to an extreme, too, um, because you, you have to be able to take counsel at the right time so that the right things can occur, because if you don't, then the circumstances will change and then bad things can happen. The next is senesis. And you don't have to say, God bless you, when you hear this. Okay, senesis. Senesis is the virtue that knows when the, it's the virtue that helps me to know when the common law applies, right? So I know that, you know, s stealing somebody's car, the common law says, look, don't steal the guy's car. And so I know I shouldn't steal the guy's car. Okay, so it just helps me to know when the common law applies. This is slowly even deteriorating. It's kind of shocking, but this is usually a pretty foundational virtue. Most people can develop it pretty easily, but it's even that's getting deteriorating in relationship to it. Uh, to our culture. The next one is nome. This is the, vir the ability or the virtue by which I know when the common law doesn't apply. So, for example, the church says the common law is you have to go to Mass on Sundays. Well, if you're sick, the common law is set aside. Right? And so you have to know that you don't go to Mass if you're really sick, especially if you're going to get people, other people sick, etc. Okay. This is becoming a big problem because the common law, especially in the church, is what? You obey your priest and your bishop. That's the common law. The problem is, is we're getting to the stage where there's practically hardly a priest or a bishop that can even be listened to without being led astray. And so you have to have an extraordinary amount of this virtue today in order to navigate some of this stuff. Okay. So, just a couple of quick things about vices contrary to proof. We talked about precipitation. That's the vice when one doesn't take counsel. You act too quickly. The next is cons in consideration. This is when you know the various, you take counsel and you know the various ways, you know, so when it comes to, I want to be with Bessie Sue, well, the way you know that you should be with Bessie Sue is through marriage, but there's a variety of other ways that you could do it. And so you, in consideration is, you know the proper way, but you ignore it and you pursue it in a different way than is the best. Okay. Inconstancy, that's when I know you know, I should stay away from Bessie Sue. She's just bad news, right? <laughs> uh, but then she comes around, and she's so beautiful, and then I think to myself, well, okay, maybe this one time. That's inconstancy, right? I know the pro proper thing to do, but then I give in in the last moment because I'm weak, okay? Which, by the way, I don't even know a woman named Bessie Sue, so I'm using put it in the first term, but I don't know a woman named Bessie Sue. 
Although at some point, some woman's going to come, that's my demon, quit using it. Okay. All right. The next is negligence. This is the failure to take counsel or to, of the failure to do what you ought to do. It's contrary to prudence. Carnal prudence. This is uh, when one seeks to achieve created goods either in a disproportionate manner or in ways that are not good. Craftiness. This is something that they call it industry and not using right or true means to an end. Someone who's crafty is really good. So the guy who breaks, we, we have a certain, Christ even said, you know, we kind of like guys like this, right? So some guy comes to a bank and he pulls out of his bag, pulls this little thing out and it opens up the door, right? And then he gets in and then he pulls out these little mirrors and blocks the laser beam so it doesn't get broken. Then he sneaks up and then he pulls out the stethoscope and sticks it to the thing, you know. And by the time it's done, he's gone through like 15 different steps and he's gotten out with the loot. And we're like, that's awesome, right? You know, but it's good. It's good on the level of natural or physical execution, even though it's morally evil. Whereas craftiness puts aside the consideration of whether it's morally good or bad. It just looks as to what's the best way on a natural level to attain this, a physical natural level. Okay. Guile. This is the person who deceive. This is the, when a person has the device of guile, which is contrary to prudence. This is when you deceive people based on words. Whereas fraud is when you do you deceive people based on deeds. And the fraud is off the charts. Or country. I mean, you've heard me talk about that in relation to fractional reserve lending. It's just a form of fraud. Two, three, or one last set of distinctions, the different kinds of prudence. One is carnal, which we just got done talking about. This is the one in which um, one proportions of bad means to a, to a good or bad end. It doesn't matter where the good is end, you're just willing to use bad means to get there. In other words, there's something evil in the process, but you're willing to do it. This is not true prudence, obviously. There's natural prudence. And this is what we've discussed in the beginning. It has a natural end, which are actually good. It's good for me to be healthy, so I should engage in fasting from time to time for the sake of my health, unless I've reached a certain stage of my spiritual life in which then I would employ supernatural prudence, which is what? Then I'm going to do this for God's sake. Now, supernatural prudence, one of the ways that people tend to, people tend to mess up is, as I mentioned, you first have to remove the natural defects first before you can begin developing the, uh, the infused virtue. What will happen is, is people who are not, um, don't have supernatural prudence will headlong go into what they hear the saints doing, applying those things on uh, what the saints used to do. You know, So well, I'm going to fast five days a week on just water and bread, maybe, maybe. You know, and then after a couple of months, they're in the hospital, right? And the reason being is because why? Because you haven't developed even the natural virtue of fasting. It's the same thing with things like prayer. Sometimes people will, you see this with seminarians, sometimes they'll start overdoing it. No, first you got to do is remove the, the vice of not having that habit. You have to develop certain natural virtues first where you're, you have a regimented time or you're consistently doing it and you're doing it for a certain length of time that's not overdoing it, right? And then at a certain point, then God will give you the grace to see, okay, now it's time with your d director. Then it's time to start maybe getting to the point where you can pray always. But there's a series of steps that you have to reach before then. And if you don't, you're going to end up causing damage. You're going to end up developing other vices, actually. Okay. So supernatural prudence has God as its end and it proportions natural means and supernatural means to attain God. Uh, natural prudence is using natural means to attain natural ends. And natural prudence is good. It's a precursor to supernatural prudence. Okay. Any questions? That's about as much as I think anybody could tolerate. Yeah. I'm not sure I understood shrewdness exactly. There's oh. something with doing something you know, quickly. Yeah. I'm not sure. About it. It's the guy who can quickly find out what's the right thing to do here in this moment. Okay. He's so, quick about it. Craftiness and shrewdness. Craftiness are they're used synonymously. Yeah, in English, those terms tend to be uh, interchangeable. But <clears throat> theologically, craftiness is in carnal prudence. The guy who's crafty is the guy who can quickly know how to steal from you. Oh, I see. 
Whereas shrewdness is the, the guy who's, who, he can quickly know, you know, no, we got to make sure this guy gets his money first before anybody else. Okay. Something like that. So it's, but it, in other words, so it's someone who is, can quickly know this is the right thing to do here. Rather than having to spend days trying to figure the thing out. Okay. Yes. What types of things can you do to mortify your imagination? Virtue. Bingo. Every yeah. Every single virtue you enact will purify and perfect the imagination. Temperance purifies it in relationship to those matters that pertain to pleasure. So when you have temperance, you'll see the chocolate and you're not moved. And so as a result of that, your image doesn't get all this flood of endorphins and pleasure and, and emotion, right? Same thing with the matters of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments. Same thing with fortitude. And fortitude, basically what happens is, is that people, a lot of times people have cowardice. They have ex excess of fear, which then clouds their judgment. You develop fortitude. So in other words, you work on going to the opposite, which we'll see that later, but you work on going to the opposite of that. And when you reach, when you become truly fortitudinous, then you can look at something and you're not afraid and it doesn't affect you. And so your images are clear. So each virtue you, each virtue you develop clears up your images. Each vice you have clouds them. Other thing is work on detachment, which is actually just a form of temperance. Working on detachment will also give you clarity of uh, images in relationship to prudence. Yeah. What would be the best virtue to pray for to kind of protect yourself from an overly emotional atmosphere? Because, uh, you know, just being day in and day out at work, and even when I go to our church, you know, and I'm surrounded by my peers, it really is the, all the emotion wrapped and rich yeah. within that, the whole culture and generation is just, and when you're around that all day, you tend to get emotional yourself Self, yeah that's like, true God, am I doing, am I, you know and then you start i to be honest with you it's just, it's really true i start thinking emotionally about things even faith-based and i gotta control myself oh yeah a bit, you know? yeah what would be a good virtue to pray for to kind of protect myself from that meekness sorry meekness meekness, <coughs> <coughs> meekness deals with anger hmm. but it's the virtue that makes you not go to extreme in your reactions you're not going to react emotionally to it Detachment, really detaching from it. Detaching from the state of the world. You know, it's like the millennials. At a certain stage, you just have to realize, like, don't get annoyed with them. I mean, first of all, they're not necessarily ill-willed. But the part of it is, too, is, is that this is just the nature of it. So the fact that they're always acting emotionally, judging everything based on emotions, the best way to shut that down is not act emotionally. I don't know if you've ever watched Ben Shapiro. Mm -hmm. That guy is constantly driving people over the edge. And the reason he's doing it is because he, he, gives, he constantly gives rational responses to their irrationality and to their emotionalism. But, and I'm not suggesting you do that just to go around annoying people, because <laughs> I don't think that's his intention either. But I think that what it boils down to is, is it's a matter of um, standing back and looking at things objectively on a regular basis. It also means that yourself as you begin to get the antecedent emotion under control, which is basically what virtue does, and when you master temperance, you master fortitude, over the course of time, you're just gonna be more objective with that stuff, and it's just not gonna to get to you. But I would start with meekness. Okay. So the, the parable of the steward who knew he was gonna be fired and then went around and reduced everybody's debt to his master, Yeah. that's one I always have trouble with, seems like yeah. he has a good outcome by doing that. Yes. Uh, and that's what I was mentioning that Christ says. You know, we kind of look at that and we're like, hey, that was pretty good, right? What Christ is, I mean, he, and then he turns to the and he says, um, the children of the world are very often more prudent than the children of the light. He's not saying that, that that's true prudence. What he's saying is, is that, um, you know, that a lot of times, as good people, we tend not to develop prudence enough or to, do, to deal with certain things of difficulty or et cetera. And as a result of that, we're not as, as crafty than the people that are not as crafty. We're not as, as prudent or shrewd as the people that are in the world. And, and there's a, that, so basically what he's pointing out is, look, part of the difficulty in being a good person is evil stuff is off your radar. 
you just don't pay attention to it because your focus is on the good. And so what can happen is, if you're not careful, is you can easily get taken to the woodshed or the children of darkness can easily arise and gain ascendancy because you've been sleeping at the switch. And this is essentially what is happening in the parable, right? The guy goes away. This guy, before he comes back, he does all this stuff, right? And that's actually what's happened in our culture. Two things happen in our culture. Good men did nothing. They saw this stuff happening. Same in the Catholic Church. They saw the homosexuals and the pedophiles getting in and they did nothing to get them out because they liked the guys on an emotional level. The second component is, is that too many people are asleep at the switch. We weren't vigilant. And so part of prudence is being vigilant, just paying attention. Now, part of that's just vigilance, part of circumspection. Paying attention, right? And so what he's basically saying is, is that Historically, I think he was basically pointing out, I think it was just a, it, it was a factual observation, that good people are very often going to be very easily taken advantage of because they, they, that evil stuff is off their radar. But not so the saints, right? Saints never get taken advantage of usually. If they do, it's because of, de it's because of clear deception. But usually they're much more perspicacious about paying attention to, hey, what are you doing over here? You're not supposed to be doing that, right? So there's kind of this interim thing where you just don't pay attention to what you should be attention to. In other words, it's be circumspect and watch, you know? <laughs> watch your book so the guy isn't cutting down on the amount of wheat somebody owes him. Oja, okay. All right, if you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedicto de omnipotentis patris et filii et spiritus et supervos et maniat semper. Amen.